Okay, if you can hear us, go ahead and type in the chat and let us know where you're hearing us from. If you're watching a recording, welcome to Noble Warrior. My name is CK Lin. Noble Warrior is where I interview entrepreneurs about their multi-dimensional journey so you can engineer your life with more impact and meaning. Of course, if you have any friends who could use more inspiration to take that leap of faith, go ahead and share this episode with them. They'll really thank you for it. My next guest is Dave Ford. He's a former media executive. He's a fellow seeker. He's an accidental environmentalist. He's the founder of the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network with 108 organizations strong. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, CK. Thanks so much for having me. Really glad to be here. Yeah. So before we dive into this big problem that impacts us all, ocean plastics, bring us back to the origin story, if you don't mind. You're a media executive making six figures, working in, you know, in big cities. I think it was New York, right? Yeah, yeah, I was in New York City. Okay, good. So what started you on this journey in the first place? Sure, yeah. So CK, I was working in New York City. I worked for this startup that had like a three-year hockey stick where it was just absolutely exploded. And I was ended up being one of the top sales guys in the company in in new york so you know i like lived in the west village i was entertaining clients at like the top restaurants in new york city for years that was like such a huge piece of my job and um yeah after three years of meteoric rise it all of a sudden uh wasn't rising so much and i yeah just sort of really i think in the in the midst of all of that really uh found myself quite un unhappy in my work space and just kind of what i was doing every day and um i had always wanted to get into travel and you know kind of going back a little bit further when i was 28 to 30 i uh quit my job and i traveled around the world for two years and i went to Antarctica, I went to the Amazon jungle, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I did all the stuff that I just never dreamed I would have done. I grew up in Baltimore. And um, yeah, so essentially this really serendipitous thing happened when I was like 35, where I got a call from this Hungarian tour guide that I met in Antarctica and he asked me to go into business with him. And you know, at first I was just like, thought it was crazy, but like the more and more I thought about it, the more and more I, um, it excited me. And really that, that just completely random out of the blue phone call totally changed the, uh, the direction of my life. Okay. So you were 35, you are not happy doing your work. And this guy called you hungry and tour guy called you and say, Hey, let's go into business. And you say yes. And just quit everything and jump right into the world of entrepreneurship? Yeah, no, it didn't, it didn't quite happen like that. So it, um, yeah, so I, he, the guy's name, Akos Hivakovic, yeah. amazing guy. He's been to every country in the world. And I was with him on a two week tour to Antarctica that I just like randomly got on and found out how to get to Antarctica when I was like backpacking when I was 28. And, you know, on that trip, when you go to Antarctica, at least when I did, and I think this holds true, you get a lot of you get a lot of like seventy five plus. It's it's the, it's the type of trip that a lot of people do, like at the Why very end of their Why life. Why I think it's because it's very expensive, and it's uh, yeah, it's kind of one of those last bucket bucket list checks to do. And for whatever reason, I think on that on that trip that I was on, I would say under the under 50 audience i mean i was probably like three people under 50 and i was like 28 so i ended up hanging out with the crew the entire time i also somehow didn't get seasick because when you cross the drake passage it's like the roughest seas in the entire world and i would say 90 percent of the people on that ship were like violently ill and for some reason i wasn't so i hung out with the crew who also wasn't seasick and i got to know everybody really well and one of which was the 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 onboard ornithologist this guy by the name of akos hivakovich and we stayed in touch and he does, he had been doing trips all over the world and he reached out to me and he just said, I'm looking for a partner in the U S uh, to help me, you know, bring more U S business, you know, U S clients into, into my, into my business. 
And that really is what like, again, that, that asked the kind of wild Zoom meeting with him back then, Zoom didn't even really work very well. Uh, it might've been Skype. Um, but at first I was just like, just didn't think it was practical or possible. And the more and more I thought about it, the more and more it just seemed to light something up inside of me. And I didn't exactly know what I was getting into, you know, and, you know, we ended up partnering and raising some money to, to start that, that initiative, uh, where it was kind of like a, you know, a collaborative between, you know, his company and, and, and sort of what I wanted to do, but it wasn't easy by any means, you know, and actually like, as I was try like planning to do all of this, um, and I, you know, my attention was definitely like kind of moving towards this. I ended up getting fired from that job, mm -hmm. which was like one of the absolute best things that ever happened to me because I wasn't planning on just like quitting and just jumping into the deep end immediately. I was going to like try to figure out how to take it slowly. And it didn't, uh, it didn't quite happen as I had planned, but it sort of shot me out of a cannon and I was in the deep end and I had no choice but to like figure it out on the fly. And we started an expedition company at the time uh, that was called Soul Buffalo. And, right. you know, it was all at the time when we first, when we first started, it was all about, you know, taking people to do the same types of experiences that I, that I went through when I traveled the world that like really like opened me up to this, you know, whole new world. I had no idea. Uh, and like connection with the environment and certainly like a, a, in, the, in its initial impetus, like a certain spiritual, spiritual component, like and that was what motivated me at the time and what was lighting me up. And um, we just went for it. And that is the, I would, I would, you know, those moments I would like, that would be like the moment where we got into what I would call the, the, the roller coaster and it started to move and yeah. all kinds of twists and turns after that. Okay. So, so I'm going to pause for a moment. We're going to Soul Buffalo um, spiritual component expedition and, you know, all of that in a moment, but put a pin on it, but come in, come back to this. So you were thinking about partnering up with this tour guide, basically being the lead gen mechanism for his tour company, right? You guys partner on this, some kind of a thing there. Um, and then you got fire, right? From your previous media company. Most people would say, all right, let me put a brick on everything. <laughs> let me just do the predictable, right? Go back to the media sales or whatever it is that I was doing. And whereas you double down on your niche and startup that you had no previous experience in doing, can you go zoom into that moment a bit? Were you married at the time? I was not luckily. Okay. So, uh, I was, you know, I was actually, I was my, my wife, now wife and I, we were probably dating for like six months at the time, but no, 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 no kid yet. We weren't married yet. So, okay, great. So, so zoom into that moment. Tell us about the the tension between the two, you know, the fork in the road, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, the, just a little backstory on the actual firing. Like, I was one of the first people that got hired in the company, mm -hmm. and you know, when you're in a startup, and I think it was the 25th hire at the time, they started mm -hmm. bringing in a significant amount of revenue for the company. You know, your status sort of raises, and like, in I think mm -hmm. in the inflection point of any business, there becomes a point where process and procedure you know, sort of, you know, there's a, there's a, there's the point where the sort of top salespeople in a company, um, sort of like rise it up. And then it gets to a point where process and pr procedure comes in and really takes over. And, uh, the, the guy, there was a, there was a different manager that was hired to manage the New York office. And he came from Google and he was very process system oriented. And I was not, and it just didn't mesh at all. The vibes mm -hmm. were not felt either mm -hmm. way. Um, but I wasn't at the time, I mean, looking back at it, I can see it. Like I, I wasn't the, the type of salesperson that they needed at that point in the business where for the first three years, I, you know, that where, where it was just going to the moon, I was, um, and yeah, I mean, I haven't seen, I haven't seen him since that, since that day, but I would, I, I'd love to shake his hand and thank him for, uh, for making what was, <laughs> what was the decision I wouldn't have made. I mean, who knows? you know, at what point I could have maybe jumped off or would have decided, but it definitely accelerated something. So like when people get fired, you know, I always, I'm always, you know, a big fan and really almost, 
almost like hold that as like a merit badge, you know, seven mm -hmm. years later. It was really painful at the time, though. I mean, mm -hmm. it was really, really painful at the time. Mm -hmm. And immediately I did have all these offers to get back into media, you mm -hmm. know, to immediately make six figures. And I saved up a little bit, not enough per se, but I'd saved up a little bit to kind of give this thing a run. And my wife, my, my you know, fiance at the time, but like she was very, she was very supportive. And we were able to raise some money from friends and family to, uh, to, to really allow that to allow me to jump in full time as well. So it was like a definitely a convergence um, of star alignment that, that allowed that all to take place. And, um, yeah, it was it was really exciting. Yeah, but I had no idea what I was doing. I've never worked in travel or I've experienced the the output of travel, but like the heavy logistics component was wild. And it turned out like what we actually the deep end we jumped into that I jumped into wasn't the deep end that I thought it was. Yeah, you know, it was the company that in his expertise, while I knew what a huge piece of his business was, which was actually wildlife photography. And I don't have any photography experience. I've been to a lot of amazing wildlife trips, but I can, I don't know if now's a good time to tell you about the first trip I took after we bought the company to Kamchatka in the Russian Far East. Where I, I do want to hear, I do want to hear about it if you don't mind. It's, it's uh, again, <laughs> put another pin on it. But I, the reason why I wanted to go into the grappling part of it is, is this. Um, a lot of people want to explore their multi-dimensional aspect of it. Some people feel called to do something. They have this big ideas that have been thinking about it and sitting on for a long time. But yet, um, because of this primal instinct and, you know, for survival and so forth, very, I would say, small percentage of people who take that leap, right? Hence why I wanted to go into those moments when you're grappling, how you're thinking about the risk and reward um and and then really this this yearning to create something of your own does, it, does that make sense so mm -hmm. is there totally. anything else you wanted to share uh that maybe a mental model maybe a tool maybe a book maybe some of the spiritual journeys you've taken on and really help you say nope this is the path i'm going to take on even though on the outside it seemed very uh risky i'd say ck that for me I went through such a transformative experience when I traveled for those two years that I developed parts of myself that I just didn't even know existed. Like the fact that I like to mountain climb and hike. And yeah, I went into the Amazon jungle and I met this incredible shaman and I had this, this very spiritual plant medicine experience. Um, this was when I was, you know, this was when I was 28, like 14 years ago with, um, Great. Let's let's go into more of that because right. on this podcast we talk a lot about plant medicine, ayahuasca, things like that. So got let's it. Go into that, if you don't mind. You got it. All right. Yeah. So I was in I was in Bolivia and I had heard about ayahuasca and it was really you know it was 14 years ago. So a lot of people weren't didn't it wasn't in the zeitgeist. It wasn't something people knew a lot about. And I was yeah I found you know someone someone told me about a about a. a, a healer a shaman that i should seek out in this little small town in bolivia called bruna Baque. i was in la paz it was just sort of a chance happened you know i was happened to be going there so i went and i found this guy who um just incredible healer and um yeah took me took me out into the jungle with some with some friends uh, that i was traveling with at the time and that experience absolutely completely you know i would say uh like on a real on a real level, like help, yeah, help me kind of heal up some holes that I had, that I had in my life and really like, uh, and really opened me up too to this, you know, to, to the idea of spirituality in a different, uh, in a different way. So I was able through that experience to just to, you know, totally, you know, access, I, th I think just like a different, a different part of myself and a different understanding about, about myself. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll do a quick share. Maybe you can go a little bit more nuanced if you don't mind. Sure. So, so before my first journey with plant medicine, I was very much, you know, trained as an academic scientist and engineer. You know, if I can't measure it, it doesn't exist. I'm very materialist, reductionist kind of a guy, right? And anything beyond scientific data, I just didn't understand or I dismissed it altogether. Then I had this very mystical experience 
uh, in it. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> open my eyes to this whole new um, world, whole new realm. And, and the way I think about it today is, um, is this, whether there is scientific data about it in my subjective experience, right? If it happens and then it's real, the subjective experience, and then I can use it to try on different perspectives of looking at the reality that we have to, um, and then anyways, my, my point of sharing all of that is it, it, it opens up my, my, my mind to this multidimensional reality aspect of reality. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, um, coming from, you know, being 28, uh, not really understanding spirituality, like what was your biggest insight going through this experience in Bolivia? Well, for me, I feel like we're kind of like taking such a, such a nonlinear, nonlinear, uh, journey through my through my life story, but for me, the real catalytic moment of that initial trip, you know, where I essentially just flew to Argentina and decided I was traveling through, uh, that I was going to travel for like a prolonged period of time, was a relationship that end very, ended very painfully, mm. um, and you know, like like dramatic like dramatically in there. I don't want to really get into the details, but it was, uh, you know, just it was extremely painful end of a relationship, I, I, I would say. And then also, you know, at the time I was working in radio mm -hmm. of all things and radio was just taking a, that was right when satellite was coming on board and the iPod and all of a sudden like radio, this like behemoth industry was just getting shattered. So it was a very painful place to work at well as at, at that time. So it was an interesting little cycle because the same thing happened again in some degree when I when I was 35, right? Like these like circular patterns that happened. And I had an Australian friend that had traveled the world that just told me that I should just go, you know, and I and I just did. I just did. I was able to I was able to take a take a loan out of uh, a house that I owned at the time to get enough cash to just take off and I, and I did and, and and like I said on that journey it really opened me up but even after all these incredible experiences and all these hikes and going to Antarctica or whatever I was still just carrying a lot around a lot of pain mm. like significant am a lot amount of pain that were primarily because of the relationship and that previous work experience but like you know probably a lot deeper than that too probably a lot of stuff you know further back but that maybe that was maybe like first on you know sort of first first up that that that, that needed to be addressed and the first you know, was, layer yeah yeah it was yeah. absolutely the first layer and when i went into that experience in the in the bolivian amazon that was my clear intention was really to, like to heal up you know this this pain that i was carrying around when i should have just been you know on all all accounts just like having the time of my life so um and when i when i did that experience it was you know and connected with that with that specific medicine um, I really feel like I, you know, the analogy I use when I tell the story is like, I was, I was like carrying around a cinder. I was dragging around a cinder block with like chain tied around my waist. And after one night of doing that, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, what I got, what I, what I got from the medicine, you know, and through, through certain visions that I had when I was deep in that state was that with respect to the job you know it was very clear like you don't work there anymore you're mm. you're traveling around in south america like totally like getting your mind blown like you can you can let that job go mm. and then with respect to the woman that i was with at the time it was really clear too it was like you did everything that you could you know at that time to help this person you know and to you know and you were like solid and strong for her in that time and you can just you can let you can let her go off to whatever she needs to do and you can do whatever you, you need to do and it was just like that it, it was it was gone those two elements you know that cinder block was cut which certainly allowed me to enjoy the rest of my trip in a in a deeper way but like it also yeah just really really connected me with nature i think in a deeper way like all the hiking and everything that i had experienced just con connected me with the earth in a in a deeper way 
Um, I ended up doing a few more experiences when I was down there in South America and in La Paz, and I was able to connect other people um, to this to this healer that I had found, and they also had similar experience. So it was just like really rewarding and fulfilling, and um, and yeah, I would say like this forever changed the trajectory of my life. And, mm -hmm. um, and certainly like when you start to think about like what I wanted to recreate when I started the travel company, this initial travel company that turned into so much more was just this, this vehicle to help people grow through these travel experiences like mm -hmm. I had gone through. I mean, so I think that was like what my initial inspiration and where initially I found so much meaning and initially where I was, why I was ready to take such a huge risk because I had just felt such a pronounced uh, effect, positive, powerful effect on my being through that decision to go travel around the world. Mm. I love that. There's so many things I can go into. Uh, when you say being, can you just clarify what that means for you? I know yeah, it's a very it's... loaded question, but... <laughs> Yeah, take it however deep you wanted to take it. Um, <laughs> I would say, yeah, just just like you know, on a on a deeper level, you know, like the full consciousness, subconscious, every, you know, just like who I am, you know, and uh, and what I'm here to do in the world. I feel like like I just got clarity, like through through that through that trip, you know, on on, on some level, like who I am and what I'm here to do. Yeah. Uh, I so appreciate you sharing your story because the way I think about this, you know, the way you describe your two-year expedition, right, and traveling to Antarctica, the Amazon, the you know Chile, trekking, you know, mountain climbing all over the world. Um, I have friends who live that lifestyle today, right? After they have retired and they're just going from peak experience to peak experience. I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome, right? And then a huge part of the ayahuasca experience is the internal peak experiences because we get to excavate, self-excavate to the depth of who we really are, right? From first layer to second layer, just, you just keep going deeper and deeper, really on the quest of defining who we are as spiritual beings living a human life, yeah? So I love the combination of the inside-out approach and the outside-in approach that you took, right? Doing ayahuasca, why are you doing the uh, activity uh, excavation, uh, sorry, the, uh, the expedition, right? So knowing, having done that for yourself and also for others, you recommend that to, to do both at the same time. Yeah, you know, I think it's a very, it's a very personal decision. And I think it's the kind of thing that individuals should do a significant amount of research on. And I think that, you know, I got lucky. I had a personal recommendation from somebody that I didn't know very well. And I trusted, trusted the universe and it worked out. But I really think like a great deal of homework needs to be done before you decide to, you know, to make sure you understand exactly what you're getting into with that specific, uh, with that specific medicine, because it's, it's definitely not for everybody. There's definitely, um, you know, there's definitely lots of contraindications in certain situations um, that just need to be taken in advance. But but yes, if after doing that research, it's something that calls you, um, I absolutely believe that it's really, really powerful. Um, and that coupling it with experience was, was certainly how, how it happened for me and worked out really well. Mm. Mm. Okay. So, so you had your personal series of peak experiences from expedition to, you know, I the journeys series of them. Um, well, uh, before we go into the company side, you want to highlight maybe a few uh, expedition peak experiences because you have mentioned in Antarctica and the Amazon and Chile, that just sounds awesome already. So is there anything that you wanted to highlight, maybe bring us into the movies of your mind? Sure. Uh, well, in that in that trip from 28 to 30. Um, yeah. You know, I wasn't that this active nature guy at all. I mean, so the I really learned to trek on that hike and to get into hiking and eventually got into like very basic mountaineering. And but I was in Patagonia, Chile, this park called Torres del Paine, which is all the way down at the tip of South America. It's beautiful. And I went with went trekking with these Israeli soldiers that I had met 
and uh these guys were like in really really good shape and moving at a really fast clip they were like they were like in good shape, but they were also like smoking cigarettes the whole time and they could like <laughs> ran around this run around me in circles sm smoking cigarettes and anyway we we ended up trying to do a four-day trek in three days and um i at some point in time i mean and these are like 25 miles a day with like 40 pounds on your back oh, at some at some point in time we thought we got lost I was way overexerted. I told, I mean, I, I thought at some point they were going to have to like call for a helicopter to get me out of there. Like my, my legs locked up and like my, my, my quads locked like crazy cramps. And then when I would get those like stretched out, then my calves would locked. I was just like hobbling around. It was like, oh it was so painful. And these two guys like at some point just started screaming at me that I, they were not going to leave me behind and that Israelis don't leave, leave anyone behind. And you are like, they were like in the military, like right out of the military. They were not messing around. And somehow I collapsed into camp at the end of that night. They like totally took care of me. It was, it was, wow. I mean, looking back at it, it was an amazing story. It was hilarious. Um, but yeah, I definitely bit off more than I can chew. But it was interesting because as painful as that was, and it took me like a, a week to recover in like a hostel, uh -huh. I was hooked after that. Like all of a sudden, I mean, A, like I was like, like I almost I, not, I, I, like I that ain't happening hooked. again. Yeah, what? yeah, like that ain't happening again. No way. And then, um, and then second, yeah, secondly, it's just like there was some deep connection that happened even through that pain, you know, that that uh that really sparked something inside of me so i love the outdoors i live in the mountains in uh upstate in the catskills really close to the catskills in upstate new york and we we got a five-year-old we try to hike as much as we can but it definitely just opened up a completely new dimension mm. so that was cool um and then yeah another i mean Bolivia was really like one of my, f I wasn't even planning to go there. And it was probably, you know, one of the most significant places that I've ever been. And I went on this wildlife uh, in the same area where I did that ayahuasca journey. I went on this wildlife expedition uh, in Runabaki, as was little, the little town, like right where the mountains meet, right where like the, the, the Andes meet, meet the, meet the river and you go on like a 27 hour bus downhill. That's like terrifying. And you're glad you stayed on the roads the whole time when you're done. <laughs> And uh, we, you, you take these little canoe boats out into this like swampy sort of pampas area where there's like pink river dolls, dolphins and these amazing, like the, the wildlife is just insane. Like the capybaras and the, you're swimming in the same water where there's all these caiman around and parrots and toucans. And I mean, you, just like you felt like you're in the Garden of Eden or that's what the Garden of Eden should look like and swimming with pink river dolphins. And I think that was like where I first got like connected to this, like, you know, the, on the on a deeper level of the wildlife conservation piece that became a big part of my work um, when we first when we first started Soul Buffalo. And um, yeah, that was that was pretty amazing. And then Antarctica was I mean, I've been a few times now. You, you it is it is like you feel like you're on another planet you know and and you, you know you go with people that have been there a lot it becomes pretty you start to see pictures of what what the terrain used to look like you really come face to face with what's happening with climate change and the melting world and uh it's it, it's something that should be seen you know i feel like the glaciers in greenland you know are the same you know and it's something that absolutely needs to be seen and needs to be experienced and it's beautiful and there's penguins and seals and whales and it's 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 a different and and just an unbelievable landscapes but you know it's melting fast and it's it's important to to take that in firsthand you know and, and be down there with experts you know to learn about it because it's it's affecting it's affecting every it's affecting everything everywhere and uh you know, if, if the modeling's right, it's going to get more dire as as uh, as time goes on here. Mm. Thanks for sharing this um, and taking us through that the movies of your mind. Um, I get a glimpse of why you love nature, right? This, you know, the, 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 because you experience beautiful sceneries from place to place with the proper guide, with the great stories of israeli soldiers yelling at you almost <laughs> losing your life i i got a glimpse of that it almost sounds like a movie it felt like a movie for sure so 
that experience I just carried with me through, you know, I, I mean, it always will carry with me as just like, hey, it's a big risk that I took. I mean, it wasn't conventional, I don't think at the time, definitely not for 28 year old Americans. You definitely have lots of people from all over the world that do this as a rite of passage. You definitely have like gap year folks in the US that'll do it right after college, travel for a year. But it's definitely not like, I would say hardwired into our DNA, like the Australians or the New Zealand, you know, people from New Zealand or or the Irish who just, or the English too, that just like travel, you know, as a, as a rite of passage. And for me, it was a rite of passage. It was definitely like, I would say just moved me into a different phase of my life, but also like just a, such a deeper understanding of the world and just meeting people from all over the world that had a very, very different perspective of what was going on than we do up here. And I feel like experience is, is catalytic in just understanding. So for me, that was, uh, that was really, really pivotal and important. Okay. So fast forward. So now that you're 30 and then you fast forward to 35, you're starting this, you know, adventure uh, expedition company with this Hungarian tour guide. And then you wanted to bring something similar to others, right? You want to bring also, if I hear you correctly, bring a spiritual components to it as well. Right? Yeah. I mean, when I first started it out, yeah. I mean, it was, we weren't going to be running journeys to the Amazon to do Iowa. That was not in the plans. That uh, was, okay. That, so that was not on the table. That wasn't, but we, we were looking at doing some like meditation retreats in India. And like there, that was like a certain type of product line that we wanted to offer. His core business was wildlife and mm -hmm. wildlife photography specifically. So he has just been all over the world doing these crazy, crazy wildlife trips. And and yeah, that was, that's what I was getting into and coming to the realization, like how difficult it was going to be to kind of infuse what I wanted to do with his core clientele. What did you want to do? I, yeah, I think I wanted it to do, I think I wanted it to align with my, with my interests more. Right. Cause I just not a photographer, not that there's anything mm -hmm. wrong with that. I love, mm -hmm. you know, been, I've been on a million wildlife trips and taken very bad pictures when I've been there, but it wasn't the, wasn't the kind of thing that uh, I had ever gotten into or was like a core interest for me. And the company that we essentially raised money to, to, to build was, and his expertise was very much in, uh, in, in, in wildlife. Now it was also in conservation and that's where, that's mm. the bridge that took us to where we are today. Um, is, is that conservation bridge. So he was a brilliant guy and he, you know, we, you know, essentially went from this, this idea that we were, we were going to take out consumers on, on trips, like individuals, like you or me, let's go on a vacation to working with big corporations and infusing them directly into the challenges of the world, you know, like taking, mm -hmm. taking senior leaders to Antarctica or, or taking senior leaders and immersing them in human wildlife con conflict issues. Uh, and that didn't happen right away. That was that the trip to the Russian far East that I mentioned earlier that where I, uh, is now a good time to bring that up, yes. to bring that. Yes. yes, yes. So go back. So go back, please. Thank you. So yeah, Kamchatka is on the other side of Alaska. It is insane. It is like, it is, uh, bears, volcanoes, uh, rain, reindeer herders. Like it is, it is really, I've never been anywhere like that before. And we went, and this is, and this was like a trip that we had, that we, that we inherited as a part of uh, the business agreement that we went. And it was the first trip I went on and it was, I mean, it was amazing, but it was the, the first leg of it was like going to see black bears and you're walking around with guys with guns. And then the photographer clientele that was there had these, like these, these lenses that are like a yard long and you get to a place where the bears are. And there's like 10 people in your group that are just taking rapid fire pictures, like machine gun style, like brrr, pictures of these bears. Right. So my wife and I just had like our point and shoot or point and shoot camera at the time. <laughs> and we were like, okay. Um, and then there was this hilarious couple from Australia that was in there, probably their eighties that were just screaming at each other the entire time. So it was like these, like there was like a couple from from Australia and then there's like five Brazilians that were on the trip. And then there was like just a, a random guy from here, random girl from there. It was just this like ragtag uh -huh. crew of people that didn't know each other, that they were all just going to take pictures. But then you have this Australian couple that were scream, I mean, screaming, not, not like, the entire time in front yeah. of everyone. And we were just like, what is happening here? So then we went, 
but but I mean the landscape was incredible. So then we went hiking and and we went into the volcanoes and it was you know which was the landscape scenery was amazing. Then we're like taking helicopters to to this remote place where we got to see these reindeer. Wow. Uh, these reindeer herders, the indigenous people there, you know, First Nations people uh, of, of the Russian Far East that were been herding reindeers in circles and just like, you know, hundreds of reindeers. And, I mean, and you're there when they are like castrating the reindeer to like make sure the, the strongest reindeer breed and they're killing reindeer for meat. Like you're watching all this. It was wide and such beautiful landscape. And we had this moment with this guy who was one of the reindeer herd herders who was probably like in his 50s and he had this little flip phone that he was taking pictures i guess of tourists that were coming through there i don't know how many tourists came through a year but not many and he and we were sitting with him and my 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 wife and i and it was this really beautiful moment where he like picked his flip phone phone up and he was showing us pictures of other tourists that have sat down and he was like taking a picture of us and it was like this really like amazing connection and then just as that was happening, the 80 year old Australian woman started taking pictures. Like, I mean, she was like, she was probably three yards from us, like right in our face with her giant camera, started taking machine gun pictures of us sitting here with this guy and just like totally ruined the moment. Totally like, it was like, again, it was like, you know, and I remember being in the tent with my wife that night, my now wife that night. And I was just like, I don't know if this model's gonna work. <laughs> and uh, and it was like it was after being on that trip that that we realized that you know we have to we have to really like take a look at what exactly we have here and figure out how to maximize it. And I had all this corporate experience. and we we started working with some of the biggest corporations in the world. Um, and we we, you know the the and and it, it really, I would say we took uh, we took it to about the uh, the bottom of the ninth inning, and uh, we didn't have uh, didn't have a lot of money uh, left from that initial investment. And uh, like literally, like if it would have been a month later, at this time I had a I had a, I had a, a two month old baby, and we closed the a, a deal to take a c-suite group from like one of the biggest energy companies in the world to antarctica um 30 40 of their leaders and that is what really like started what we what we the next phase was like the next big pivot of us working with senior leaders and, and taking and doing like experiential deep dives in in challenges of the world you know of the world and like totally shift the tra trajectory and we just never would have seen that in a million years i mean it was just like that was the roller coaster analogy i let you know it was like we wouldn't have been in the deep end we would have never discovered it you know yeah so, so let me ask you this question because this what you describe is is common in terms of hey i took a big risk my 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 spouse was uh, supportive at the time and then we you know did a hail mary hallelujah type play and then it worked out right and it shown at the end sort of um you know the, the light of at the, at the end of the tunnel so to speak but in that moment right when you said um, about a month later it wouldn't have worked out you have to, you would have to have to close everything down you had the two month old baby at the time mary already how did you keep going? What what well, kept you going in spite of all the challenges and difficulties? And and then the, the, uh, as uh, in startup people say, the lack of positive feedback loop, so to speak. Well, so this this big this big uh, this big deal was in the pipeline, right? And it was also there was also a secondary trip that this company booked with us. I wish I we have we're on like NDA from four years ago. I wish I could say who it was, but a big. Fortune 50 energy com energy company that and not one of the big oil and oil and gas conglomerates anyway, but they um, they so we had like this Zimbabwe trip also booked and things were like lining up and it was like a random introduction how we got in there it was like a friend of a friend introduced us to the like to a C-suite sort of education and leadership component and it was like the timing was right the budgets were right there was something that was like on their list to do it was you know, like they, they wanted to do in a quick time period it was like all these components and, and this and it was sitting there like as you know in the pipeline for lack of a better way to put it and it was going to make or break you know this relationship with this company and we 
I remember calling a friend of mine, a really dear friend that I've known for forever. And I just said, I don't know what's going to happen with this deal. I don't have any idea, but whatever it happened, whatever happens, we're going to keep going. Like we're going to make this work and whether it happens or whether it doesn't happen, it does, it doesn't happen this trip to Antarctica and this trip to Zimbabwe, I'm going to, you know, we're going to figure out a way to make this thing work. Right. So and, what's the resolve, like, yeah, what was the yeah, resolve? yeah. It was just a resolve, you know, and I had a, had a two month old baby and, and, um, it worked, it ended up working out. So I didn't have to go to plan B. I don't know what plan B would have been, but, um, it worked, you know, and we, in, in that model, before we pivoted, we were, we, I pivoted again. We did for, uh, well, we before for, you, like, if you talk about the pivoting, what, what was it about the result though? Was it your faith in the, in the, in the, in the mission, your faith in yourself and the faith in the universe? Like what was the source of the result? At the time I was reading Ryan holidays, the op obstacle is away, like over and over and over again. I don't know if you know that book, it's all about stoicism. Um, so Ryan holiday, I actually tried to try to book him personally to go on that trip with us. But I like, I just kept reading the obstacle is the way and just really was just trying to shift my first personal philosophy to like, okay, something bad happens. Like that's actually a good thing. Just like when I got fired, right? Mm -hmm. Total obstacle is the way like that was at the time incredibly painful, but it turned out to be this like catalytic force in my life. So I, I was just working off of that. I was working off of that philosophy and like really getting into stoicism and really like understanding, you know, the, the nuances of that and just trying to look at whatever life was throwing at me as a, as you know, a fuel for growth or like a good thing, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the, one of the, I think one of the interesting things and what I remember from that book is like Thomas Edison and his lab burned down and like, I think the twenties or late teens or whatever. And he remember, and, and he, they tell a story about how he like gathered his whole family and like took them to see this like multi multifaceted chemical lab on fire because it was all these different colors. And he was just like, not phased at all. Like, we're going to come back stronger for this. Like whatever's happening here is going to propel us forward. And it did, you know, and it was just like so many stories out there about that. So I would say that you, like, learning deeply about stoicism has helped my entrepreneurial journey significantly and that's where i was right then and like in that december of it was 2017 maybe yeah mm -hmm. would you call yourself a, a a practitioner of stoicism like is that I, your that sort of the core of your operating system your core belief i would say it's definitely mental model that i go back to uh, significantly and it's like in the toolbox for sure mm -hmm. well the, the the reason i ask is because stoicism is very hmm, i don't know if you ever studied spiral dynamics but anyways so there's like different levels of consciousness right so i was curious given your um psycho spiritual experiences spiritual journeys with ayahuasca you know if that you know, sort of how you think about your place in the, the in the greater universe, so to speak. I, I haven't uh, studied spiral dynamics. Give me a little bit more on that. Sure. Uh, so so uh, down back wrote an interesting uh, came up with the interesting model called spiral dynamics. Essentially, it talked about um, the come from place of consciousness. So there's different levels uh in hierarchies um you have the the tribal and then you have the sorry let me backtrack you have you have a color red it's it's all about you know um optimi optim optimization of the tribe and you have orange it's all about entrepreneurship it's all about in um, taking care of um sort of the self right the, the, the ego itself the ego expression like thy will be done sort of so to speak then you have um color blue it's all about sort of um like law right R rules and regulations and then you have uh green color green it's all about the 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 collective whole right so environmentalism sort of was came out of that 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 idea and then you have um i think after that is it's orange Sorry, after that is gold. It's all about the optimization of the entire system, 
and then you have teal and then you have other colors. Um, not a huge um, practitioner in that, but I, I, th I find that to be a really interesting mental model when I think about um, the come from place in terms of coming up with new and, and interesting uh, ideas and, and path and uh, innovations and solutions. So anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a book I, I recommend. Yeah, I want to yeah. check that out. It sounds or, fascinating. Uh, fellow seekers. Um, but let's actually go back to, to you. So now you are taking um, executives from energy companies to, to share with them, um, take on different uh, uh, expeditions in, 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 in a beautiful environment. Can you share with us a little bit um, environmental issues, climate change issues? It's such a big thing that impacts us all but it's so remote, so to speak. We don't see it every day. Therefore, um, when it's out of sight, it's out of mind. So I'm curious to know, how do you have, how do you inspire them to care about something that may not necessarily be in their everyday life? I think the experience directly is really, is really fundamental and really important. And, you know, we're, we're, we're working on a thesis right now. That's with my current work. Then I guess we'll, we, we'll get there. So we'll put another flag in the flag in yeah. the ground around this, but around environmental intelligence and about how there's components uh, like experiential being like a, like a big piece of it is like how you can connect on an emotional level with any of these big environmental challenges. Right. So like walking on a beach covered with plastic in a, in the developing country or seeing rivers, you know, totally, you know, covered deeply in plastic or, um, or being in, 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 in Antarctica and understanding, you know, that this giant, you know, hillside that you're seeing used to be a glacier, you know, hundreds of feet high. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, uh, the second piece that we think is really important is a positional, uh, intelligence so understanding oppositional forces getting environmentalists and and act, uh, environmental and activist organizations to understand industry and government and vice versa like on a really deep level and to understand all sides of the of of the equation to really like deeply integrate and understand it and the last piece is just to educate on facts so when you're in antarctica and you're teaching about climate change it's going to retain you're going to retain it you know in a deeper way you know and there or and understanding the basic facts inside of an organization are really important right like because facts are always changing there's a half-life to facts we used to think when we were kids they used to think dinosaurs were green and slow and re these and now we know they're like multicolored and a lot of they came a lot of them came from birds and it was like totally different ball game than what we were taught the facts have changed um there's all kinds of theories you know going back into history that are being challenged right now like i don't know if you're familiar with graham hancock's work a little bit yeah well yeah. that's He's a rabbit that's a, that's a lab rabbit hole but you know he has a th he's pr putting a theory forth that the world got hit by a comet in in 9600 bc that caused all like the great flood myth it's fascinating but it would totally rewrite the history books right mm -hmm. so what we've known as facts you know are, are are always changing and that happens specifically with the in the with the environment and you know every day like right now we're teaching there are 11 million metric tons of plastic like a garbage truck and a half worth of plastic at getting into the uh, getting into the ocean every every minute. But we know that's that number is wrong because the numbers predate COVID. You know, they predate you know all these all this the, all these masks that are definitely in in the in the system and and the struggles for the waste management sector that's happened as a result of COVID. But we're still teaching 11 million metric metric tons because that's the best data we have. So again, like this idea of environmental intelligence, like is going and, and experiencing directly what's happening, understanding the opposing viewpoints, and then just rooting into the facts and scaling them across your organization, right? And, and across value change and across, you know, every all of us. Yeah. So so I have a follow-up question, and that is this. And I, and I like that we sort of started this conversation with uh, levels of consciousness. And even if you, even if that theorem is incorrect, it, it's basically what is the system? What, what's our incentive, extrinsic incentive that compel us to do certain things, right? So when you're in, let's say, energy company corporations and whatnot, their incentives is, um, that's what I'm looking for. Basically, it ROI, right? You know, company performance and that, that's their incentive. So, and, and, 
and this may be a little bit of projection because I'm not a you know energy executive, so I don't know how how they actually think. Um, the way I think about it is like here's 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 resources from nature, and let's tax it, and so then we can derive benefits from you know corporation and so on and so on. This and this may be a totally simplified version of it, but I'm curious to know how do you even get them to care about something that may not be necessarily their performance metrics. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, like, like why do they even care to, uh, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I intellectually am curious about issues in, about the environment, but let's say, even if you gifted me, you know, let's go to the plastic gyres. Let's go to, you know, a uh, wasteland where hundreds of people are picking up trash. If you give to me that tour to me, I don't know if I wanted to see that firsthand, right? So I'm curious to know, how do you even, you know, get someone who is really have a cushy job, really comfortable to even want to do that? Sure. You know, it's uh, from a corporate perspective, it's an existential risk management threat to okay. the business and what there's some trends that are happening right now you know specifically with plastics and climate and and otherwise that are really interesting that are like movements that are happening that in the next 10 years i, I think are going to put a lot more pressure on business one of those is it's called the eco side movement mm -hmm. so essentially it's elevating elevating the movement is to elevate environmental crimes to the level of war crimes so mm -hmm. For example, there was this meme going around. I don't know if you ever, I feel like everybody saw it like last last week or a week ago where the ocean was on fire in the Gulf of Mexico. Did you see did that mm. show up no. in your Twitter feed? No. It's like it was it was it was basically a fireball in the middle of the ocean. Um, and it went the memes went crazy and it was some sort of pipeline explosion. They put it out. But think about the BP oil spill, right? Yep. So that would be elevated to like an international war crime status as mm. opposed to it, which which is is puts a lot a lot of onus on corporations to make sure that they're not uh, they're, that they're doing the right thing environmentally. There's another movement called the first rights of nature movement mm. where just like a corporate, a corporation has the ability to sue a corporation can sue another corporation the 14 or i think it's actually i think it's 18 countries right now that recognize mm. first rights of nature where indigenous populations can sue corporations and governments on behalf of rivers or forests mm. so think mm. about the amazon jungle su suing the brazilian government mm -hmm. Now it's not that's that in that it's not legal in Brazil right now, but in in New Zealand it is, and there's a the Maori mm. people there are uh, the Maori people, sorry, the Maori people there are suing the or um, have a lawsuit, you know, that's going out on behalf of a river, right? So this existential threat on risk management, the, and the other piece is the financial community is putting pressure through uh, what's called. ESG scores, or it's like environmental, social, governments, governance scores with companies. Mm. So, uh, and basically, there's there's certain funds that are just ESG scores. There's a lot of pressure from the financial uh, from, from the financial world for companies to do the right thing as well. And all this is just ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. You also see situations where like activist investors just took three board seats uh, over on Exxon of the twenty board mm. seats. You know, there was an, there was basically a a very small hedge fund called engine one that got a shareholder resolution in place and all the pension funds that invest in exxon basically you know voted to bring three of these board seats to you know environmental activists mm. this is all going to accelerate significantly so while it might be tough to get you know you, you know to get somebody like you who is who is eco-conscious and and wants to see the right thing happen to be like i want to go spend you know two weeks seeing the plastics crisis you know which makes sense the the executives at these companies like need to like they absolutely like because they need especially if if their product is is floating around in the ocean or on, or on these rivers because it's an existential risk management threat that's only going to get more important and more and more pronounced as time goes on so yeah that's mm -hmm. uh that's where it gets you know and and you know i should say too like the way so we we did these trips for years and i was in india with the same company actually and after a after a, an expedition we did in southern india that was about tigers and and elephants fighting with people i did a one-day waste tour 
in Delhi. And I saw this landfill called the Gazapur landfill. I was with these university professors and I, and it was this giant mountain inside of town. And it, for me, I'd never seen anything like this before. That was half on fire that was smoking. And the other half was like hundreds of people picking trash, you know, out of, uh, out of this landfill. And meanwhile, it's like, there's like a, 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 a market there. Cows are walking in front and every, like, like right next to the landfill. And it just so blow, blew my mind. And it was right when the plastic zeitgeist was like really starting to snowball. And it was like in that moment, then my partners and I brought the idea back to, to my partners and I, and we were just like, we gotta, we gotta do something here. Like, and we basically chartered a ship that was going from Antarctica to the Arctic because we had all these Antarctica connections. And we ran the first ever ocean, we call it the Ocean Plastic Leadership Summit, where we got 165 uh, environmental groups the companies we had like six CEOs of some of the biggest plastic companies in the world. We had Coca Cola and Dow Chemical and uh, Greenpeace and the American Chemistry. All these like all these forces that that don't don't normally talk stuck on a boat together four days uh, for four days in the middle of the Atlantic Gyre, which is the garbage pack, which is the garbage patch, which is where the where the, all the microplastics and the plastics spin in circles. There's five of them in the world. And we had executives 500 miles off the coast of Bermuda, two miles deep, snorkel snorkeling and pulling handfuls of waste out. And we had a big consumer packaged goods company find one of their toothbrushes out there, mm. you know, that they were able to take back home. And I mean, it was a powerful, powerful experience. And it really you know, f feeds into that what I talked about, this idea of experiencing and understanding, you know, the oppositional viewpoints and rooting into facts. We did education. We ran, we ran labs on the ship that turned into real initiatives. It just could not have gone better this, this expedition. And it totally, so then all of a sudden it launched us into this, the, the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network which we're doing today, right? We've, we ended up sunsetting Seoul Buffalo um, to, to focus on the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network, where we're now 100, as you mentioned in the beginning, 110 organizations dedicated to capacity building through experience and through, through getting, getting groups to understand each other. So it's just been this, this another, another big drop in the roller coaster. And uh, we're just like got our hands up in the air now. It's been, it's been pretty wild. Congratulations. That's awesome. I know that you also been featured on uh, Scientific American, right? With the with the work that you do in terms of th thought leadership. Um, so, very still very early in many more things to come your way. I'm sure. Um, I want to zoom in on the human uh, behavior component just a bit more, if you don't mind. Sure. The second thing that you had talked about, basically bringing people from all sides, right? The activists, the corporations coming together to talk. I love that idea intellectually. However, right, if I am a big energy company that sort of being painted as a, like a, a, you know, being demonized for causing all this, and there may be some portion of it to, to be real, I don't necessarily want to interface with someone who demonizes me as an example, or the other way around. If I'm an activist, I don't necessarily want to, you know, talk to someone who nest who who thinks of me as a as a, as a you know a, a anarchist or something like that right so i'm using these very emotionally charged words perhaps intentionally or perhaps unintentionally but i'm curious to know how were you able to bring people together who don't necessarily love seeing each other in parties as an example so how did you do that well i feel like in this specific issue or the ocean plastics issue i mean the, the same end goal is there whether you're a corporation that makes plastic or uses plastic or whether you're an environmental NGOs and that's, we want to get plastic out of the environment. Like that is that we want clean oceans. Like there's an agreement on endpoint. Now solutions about how we're going to get there. That's where it's like an absolute war zone. That's where it's, you know, there it, it's like walking through a field of landmines, right? So like I always talk about how like our organization, because we built the trust of these, polar opposite type organizations were like walking on a tightrope. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, I think, you know, the fact that we all want the same thing at the end of the day that, that makes it easier. And there is something to be said for learning from from each other. I mean, the, the environmental organizations, a lot of the, you know, the break free from plastic organizations, they're putting significant pressure on these organizations to 
change their ways and activating consumers who buy these products to raise awareness. So, you know, there's there's naturally like a, a I feel like an important opportunity for like to come together and have these really tough tough discussions just to see where you're where they're aligned and where they're not. And we found a lot of times there's more aligned there's there's a lot surprising alignment and there's also fault lines and and places where battles need to be, you know, hard line hard hard lines in the sand, you know, in some cases obvious. Like mm-hmm. plastic companies want to continue producing plastic and they want to figure out how to fix the waste management infrastructure to uh, handle an increased load of plastics coming into the environment as populations are projected to grow significantly in the next 20 years where uh organizations that are you know in the break free from plastic movement or a lot of the ngos want to shut off plastic at the tap Mm -hmm. you know and use alternative materials and like rethink the way our systems work so that we're like taking a you know, taking a bottle back, a shampoo bottle back and refilling it, you know, rather than just buying another bottle and another bottle and another bottle and hoping it gets recycled. I mean, it's, I can go really deep about how complicated it all is, but there, there's different, um, there's different solutions that are sometimes in conflict, but the end goal is the same, you know, it's like, how, mm. how can we do this? And it, this really feels like even as chaotic and complex as this issue is, that is, is one that, that can be solved. Um, and it's going to take a significant amount of work and a significant amount of really education and capacity building across every human being on the on the planet. So, so you can solve this problem in two ways, uh, obviously more than two ways, but yeah, to, in the overly simplistic sense, is is help and optimize different paths to agreement, right? The multiple parties coming together and you know, find the most optimal path to to that. So i um, curious to know if there's a solution there. There's also obviously a solution that you're focusing on that is more on the education side of things, right? So uh, my understanding, right, correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, you know what? Why don't you articulate it? I mean, what is the current uh, iteration of what you're doing? Well, yeah, the, the, the current iteration inter- iteration company yeah it's really it's really around capacity building right it's about so it's 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 and it's through experience and through positional understanding and then through education on the basic facts we we have software that we work with big companies where we can put thousands of employees through like 101s on like what is climate change what is ocean plastics what is deforestation what is coral reefs the ESG, you know, uh, financial mechanisms, the, what, what is that? And why does that apply to business? What is, what is eco side, right? Like how you can, and you can take these and they can scale from the C-suite to forklift drivers on the, on the, on the factory floor so that these companies understand what it is. Uh, people that work for the, these companies understand why it's important for their businesses, you know, and, and that they depend on for their families. There's also like feedback loops where people from the field can can come up with great ideas and communicate them back to uh, to leaders in their sustainability departments. You know, if there's anything that I would say is like wh- encouraging, frustrating, and encouraging in the same level is like a lot of these really big companies that are massive only have two or three people working for them in, mm-hmm. in sustainability, right? And these people are expected to, to you know, address all of these issues, whether it's packaging, whether it's food waste, whether it's climate and carbon, it, car, like, and there's, there, the teams are small. And we're, it's frustrating you know, that that is the current state, but we're starting to see a, a lot of growth uh, in those departments. You know, I was on a company with a big fashion company of 20 people working in sustainability. And I was like, wow, that is incredible. Like you don't, you don't hear that where you, you know, some of the retail companies we work with have three. And, you know, as the environmental challenges of this world are established more in this sort of risk management, like existential risk management piece, um, we're going to see those, those teams grow in a big, big way. And though the, and we've already in the last, in the last 10 years, like, CSO, you know, the chief sustainability office, you know, officer, I feel like for a while was there for a reason. It was a checkbox. And we're starting to see the CSO, the CEOs lean on the CSO significantly because so much of the business performance are, are, are really intersecting with what's happening uh, in the, in the environment and their impact on the environment. Yeah. Awesome. So, so if I'm hearing you right, uh, um, Corporations have more and more um, resources allocated to address this existential problem. 
And, and then now they're hiring more um, professionals, executives to help looking at this. And then you are the media slash education company that's going to help them essentially scale the awareness, the education aspect of all of this, the how, and also how that impacts their business. Is that an accurate recap on what you just said? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and, and helping them learn and be a resource resource for them to be learned. Now, one of the crazy things that's happened in the last six months, we were asked by our partners at the World Wildlife Fund to run a global convening on the Global Plastics Treaty. So just like the Paris Agreement, there's movement right now among governments to have a global plastics treaty, which would address, they're still figuring out exactly what this is, 100, uh, as of today, uh, July 12th, 100 countries have come out in favor of this. They're the deci official decision is, is supposed to happen next February, but we're doing these global convenings online while we're in COVID times, where we brought together 140 organizations, activists and industry to learn from each other uh, about this plastics treaty, which is kind of wild and kind of like, to go back from like the Kamchatka trip, like this, this thing started from, and from us now to be, you know, running a global education company and being asked by like major NGO partners to facilitate dialogues around global treaties and talking to ambassadors and talking to, you know, you know, like really senior government officials. It's just kind of like, well, I think we all kind of like look at ourselves in the mirror and we're just kind of like, whoa, you know, this is, um, we would have never in a million years thought that this is what we were going to do when, when, or, you know, when Akos, Ako Shivakovich called me mm. in uh, in 2015 and, and wanted a partner for his wildlife photo photography company. So, so in in all of this, this is a very complex issue, obviously, and with a lot of different players, a lot of different stakeholders involved, and the time scale is is vast, right? You know, from probably like multi decades to multi multi generations. So, how do you track for you as a as a media slash education company helping educate sort of the, all of the stakeholders towards this multi generational path? Um, how do you even track the progress that you're making? Well, I mean, I think you know as we as we continue to grow our, our courseware, I mean, it's it's courses delivered, right? And it's uh, you know when we I think you know we 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 hold true that we'll we'll be you know in a short order here and uh we'll be delivering like hundreds and thousands and millions of courses you know over over you know year after year and that is that's that's you know a, a stat that we can track and then i feel like that you know how does it ripple out into the world i mean i think one of the amazing things is that we work with some of the top ngos in the world right we work that that are tracking this specifically the world wildlife fund being one on the counter side you know greenpeace being another you know that there is the, the ocean conservancy the ellen macarthur foundation lots of these amazing organizations that are um, the world economic forum that are really deep in the weeds that are really have incredible data and it's up for us to take that data in that they're building and then and then educate everyone about it, right? It's like it's really like a synthesis, you know. And then also looking at looking at industry data as well, you know, and make sure, you know, that 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 data is presented side by side, you know, in a neutral way where where people can comment on it. Um, so, you know, I think that with all these issues, they're so tricky, they're so complex, they're th they're so challenging, but you know, it's, it's just like drumbeat is so, super important. If we can keep that drumbeat, that drumbeat up, whether it be to, for a global trap, you know, for a meaningful global tra plastics treaty to, to come to life through the governments or, you know, you know, everything that needs to accelerate with climate change, et cetera. Like, it's just like, how can we be out there and just be this drumbeat to make sure that everybody knows about it because it's just the, the, the it, they're so complex. I think a lot of people glaze over a lot of people that aren't, like you said, material material, you know, if you live in where I live in, in, in the Catskills in New York, like the oceans are a long way away. And here in the U S you know, while if you walk the beaches of my, of uh, Miami, you're going to have see plastic washing up, you know, or if you're, you're on Pacific coast in, in certain places, plastic will be washing up. It's nothing compared to Southeast Asia. It's very much feels like their problem on the other side of the world, but it's, it's all of our problems. I mean, the whole world's interconnected, right? So, you know, I feel like, um, you know, raising awareness fast is, is, is so, so critical, you know, and it's not just, 
it's not just and it's and it's you know raising all these narratives that sometimes compete you know to make sure people understand like and, and have the full spectrum of understanding you know from all these different viewpoints is there any technology that you come across that um essentially tie the economic um incentives to their environmental or the, the moralistic you know incentive uh, together a la maybe like a crypto mechanism or nft of some sort i mean i'm just making stuff up right anything of that sort that's essentially tying everything together so i mean i wouldn't say it's as uh you know as uh, as advanced as as it, as it as it should be or will be but i mean i think esg the, the best thing we have right now is an esg score because it, me it measures environment it measures social you know, which would be, you know, diversity and inclusion metrics and, you know, how, how companies treat their people and then and then govern and then governance, like how the actual uh, company governs. Right. Like what their what their uh, CEO to pay ratio is, you know, to, you know, from the from the top to the bottom kind of vibe. Like and those scores, the most important about those scores is that they they the billions of dollars are being directed, you know, based on those scores. So it's that's that's the best thing I, I think that we have going for us with relation to business and uh, and the environment and and social issues and everything right now. But you know I I, I know there's a lot of that if you you hear of anything, let me know because yeah yeah for sure. I mean I'm I'm always interested in how complex issues can be synthesized into something that's simplistic. Uh, but that, that can hide the complexity can still, you know, there's a singular score or, or metrics that we can, we can look at and then and, and help move the needle uh, along the way. Because even if, for those listeners who, who isn't, you know, perhaps as passionate about this as Dave or any of the stakeholders there, everyone's on the same space boat, the <laughs> space trip <laughs> So something that uh, that impacts all of us. So I think this is something that I would like to see more effort and more more innovation and more, um, you know, uh, the kind of things that that you're working on, Dave. So really, really thank you for sharing your perspective with all of us. Anything that you think I should be asking about it and ask? No, spaceship Earth, man. I feel like that's uh, that's that's right in the heart. That, that you're you're exactly right. I mean, we only have we only have one we only have one planet, and uh, it, the only way we're going to figure this out is together. So, yeah, I'm yeah. just really really honored to be invited. I feel then uh, I love I love the I love everything I know about Noble Warrior. So thank you for uh, inviting me inviting me on your spaceship. Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, one last thing I, I will want to ask. You had said. You, when you first get that call when you were 35 from this Hungarian tour guide, you had no idea what it would have been, you know, years later and you know, working with ambassadors from different countries and really help brokering really uh, the, 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 different, um, the different players. So then they come to the table and talk about this and bring that bridge builder from players of all shapes and sizes and who may not like each other so much. So, so knowing what you know now, what would you say to the younger Dave who's grappling with, should I, shouldn't I? I don't know if this is something I want to do. I don't know if um, this is even a realm of, you know, exploration I want to jump into. What would you say to the younger Dave listening? I would say that trust, believe, and, and just like, and just, and, and just, realize that you know that what you're doing is exactly what you're supposed to be doing you know in the spirit of saving a significant significant amount of stress <laughs> that i've experienced on that roller coaster right i mean because that's the you know that's it i mean going back to like the stoicism piece it's like every bump in the road is what like they're so important you know they're so um yeah, they're so foundational, you know, and I, I wouldn't change anything, anything that that's happened or any of the hard times, you know, because each we've learned so much from from each of them. And we've discovered these opportunities to like really make a difference through that. Like, you know, my my partner uh, is, you know, edu he ran an education company for 20 years. You know, he was our first investor went back when we started. We started the travel company and he is, you know we didn't know that there was this this education void in the middle of all this until we got there you know if we weren't swimming around in the deep end 
you know, like figuratively and, and metaphorically, like we were like when we were snorkeling in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, like if we weren't doing that, we would have never figured out that like companies need to educate their people about these issues. And it's not only it's not not that they, they it's not that they need to, it's that they have to because you know it's it's a serious serious risk management issue and if we weren't flapping around out in the ocean for a lot of this and like figuring you know and like turning and making really key strategic decisions every step of the way and pivoting six times or i mean what four times or however many pivots this has been um we would have never found really what our like unique proposition is and our unique our unique contribution is what i should say right like our, this unique you know way that we can contribute so you know now as we're growing and 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 really you know understanding what it is we do um and what and what we can provide and how we can be useful it's incredibly incredibly you know meaningful work i mean it just feels feels like i'm just so blessed and grateful that i'm able to do this work every day and able to do this and work with the people that i do and it's not just me I and mean, we have an amazing amazing team that is just like kicking ass every day and um yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I would say to anybody right now, kind of going back to our initial intention around the talk about risk taking is like, you know, sometimes you just need to jump in and and you need to is you you need to go if, if if you have a certain thing that's moving you inside of you, you just need to go for it and and you know, it, lots of bumps in the road, but you know, the obstacle is the way. Mm. With well, that said, Dave, thanks so much for being here on Noble Warrior, the founder of. Ocean Plastics Leadership Network. Check out their work. It's um, it's really worthwhile. And like a, what we were talking about earlier, this is the only spaceship that we have. So so thank you for doing such an important work. And thank you for sharing uh, your journey, multifactorial, multi you know, fractionalized journey that you've taken on. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you, CK. I appreciate it, my friend. Really, really excited to, excited to come on and, and grateful. Thank you. All right, let's end.